right, so hello again. Um, so, I hope you enjoyed my last video on the first part of the Polish literature. Um, today we're going to be talking more about it, obviously. Um, so, it should be quite interesting because, so last time we've covered everything from the Slavic times up to um, just before Romanticism kicked in, and now we're going to cover Romanticism and further. It, sh it should be quite interesting, so I hope you'll tune in. Um, it seems like the last video did get quite a lot of engagement and people seem to like it, so I was going to continue with it um, and then hopefully I can move on to some other books. Um, so yeah, I hope you like it. So yeah, um, don't forget to like the video and also subscribe, that is very important. Um, other than that, let's just start. Um, so. Romanticism was a very important period in Polish literature. Compared to like any other period, um, I don't think anything had so much impact as Romanticism. Because, so, Polish history was extremely turbulent at the time. So if you remember well, so in the last video I was talking about um, Austria, Prussia and Russia taking over Poland. So Poland disappeared off the map. Now, obviously, the na nationalistic spirit continued. And a lot of romantics were very driven to get back independence and get back Poland in general. They really wanted to just have it back, naturally, because it was their country. You know, even even in the last video, we did talk about um, Mikołaj Ray. He was he was literally saying that uh, Polish have their own language, they have their own culture, they they are still relevant and important. Um, and I think that. Romanticism sees that rise of all of those, all of this um, poetry and uh, prose, trying to you know engage everyone into you know the proper um, patriotic spirit, and it was just beautiful. Um, so that was the time when we get massive conflict between romantics and the classicists, who didn't really like the romantic ideas, um, and more importantly, we get Miskevich. He was one of the biggest um, personas at the time. He wanted um, he wanted to get the independent Poland, and obviously, you know, the intelligentsia, the people who are artists. How can they help with you know encouraging people to fight for it, for fight for what was lost? Obviously, uh, via be it articles, be it. Um, poetry, be it prose, there are various different mediums, also art, um, music, so they kept trying and as we as we will see in a few minutes, um, it was actually quite successful. So Miskevich, he was he was even compared to Goethe. Um, by the way, very important, I know that Goethe is in, uh, pronounced differently in English, I absolutely refuse to pronounce it differently. So Miskevich was often compared to either Byron or Goethe, because he was so skilled at writing. He was just amazing. So this this is what happened. Um, and he wrote Jade, that's ba that basically loosely translates into Forefather's Eve. Um, you may have heard of the Forefathers Eve from The Witcher, as there was one quest where you, um, I don't remember the quest read as well, um, but it was called Forefathers Eve, which was um, an old Slavic and also Lithuanian feast that was commemorating the dead. Um, it was, you would, you would prepare the food in hopes that um, the ghosts from the purgatory, I think, wouldn't uh, try to attack you or anything, so they would basically spare you. Um, it was a very important, um, you know, ritual at the time. Um, these days you don't really get um, Forefathers Eve anymore, other than maybe in Belarus. That's the only place where they still celebrate it. Um, but it's no longer existent in Poland and, and such. Uh, I'm assuming probably because of the rise of Christianity. Um, so no one really wanted to do that because it was, you know, more of a icky um, ritual that's related to, you know, um, paganism to some extent, I'm assuming. Anyway, so Miskevich, he didn't only write the Forefathers Eve, he also wrote Polish words, he also wrote Pan Tadeusz, um, which translates loosely into like Mr. Ted, um, very important. He also wrote quite a few 
poems that drew on Slavic mythology a bit. So, for example, Svitizyanka was my favorite poem, honestly. Uh, we had to learn it by heart at school. Um, it was just so enjoyable. I still remember it. I am not going to recite it to you because you don't want to hear Polish, but honestly, spot on. I don't think there's tr there's a translation of these um, story, this, these poems in English, but this is something that I would like to do myself at some point. Anyway, so just quickly, Świdzianka was covering um, a story of this girl who's trying to woo this boy in the woods and eventually he you know she's being like coy and stuff and he's trying to you know convince her that everything will be well and he will look after her so she's like great and it turns out she wasn't actually a, a girl she was actually a proper um nymph um and she drowns him yes top story i liked it a lot but yeah um so a little bit more on the Forefather's Eve, um, not the ritual, but the book. So that was a drama strongly influenced by Byron. It was romantic. It was basically written of the, after the failure of the November insurrection. So obviously um, in Poland, uh, at the time when they were taken over by so many countries, um, Poland was Polish people are trying to constantly you know rebel against that which was really cool and you know quite noble and quite patriotic so you had the November insurrection you also had the um, January uprising there, there was quite quite a few because you know they just want independence fair dues so the whole failure of the November insurrection exerted a massive influence over Mitzkevich. He was very upset over the situation. So that's why he wrote it. And now, again, as I did, did go to a Polish school in the past, you are tortured with um, that specific book quite a lot. Um, it is a very important piece though. It's I think it's like, it covers four parts. Um, and it's an extremely important historical writing, in all, in all honesty, because it's extre extremely patriotic. As I said in the past, like, sorry, as I said in the previous video, um, a lot of, out of Polish literature from that time was highly patriotic or highly religious. Romanticism, that's where all the patriotism was at because they wanted independence. It was very important to them. So they wanted to communicate that via literature and art, all the creative mediums they could get. So this was very important. So a little bit on For Father's Eve. Um, so you've got you've got the prologue where you've got Gustav and you've got Conrad and you know that the, the main guy writes on the wall, oh today Gustav has died, today Conrad was born. And it's and it's uh, there, again, there's there's some more lore about this because that Conrad was actually a name from Mitskevich's previous book called Conrad Wallenrod, who was the hero who sacrificed his life and happiness for his country's sake. So you can already see those patriotic themes there, um, and it's very interesting because like Mitskevich completely devoted himself to the cause. So everything that he wrote was, you know, in order to get things going, get things, get people passionate about the cause. And he was fairly successful as well. So another thing was that a lot of people were actually exiled to Siberia in the time by the Russian Tsar. Um, and he wanted to present uh, the cruelty of the Russian Tsar. Uh, he wanted to show like how much the Polish people were persecuted. Um, and you know, there's just so much stuff happening in the book. Like you've got ghosts, you've got angels, you've got the devil, you've got Poland, you've got visions. There's so much stuff. And like the Poland is meant to be the Christ of Europe because it's persecuted for no reason. And you know, the national suffering and such, you get a lot of those things. And you've got out of parallels to, um, to Christianity as well in the Bible, um, which I think is quite important because again, at the time, Poland was in fact a Christian country. So that would speak to the people who lived there at the time the most. Um, and it's quite interesting because like, 
even the characters uh, in the drama, because it was a drama, so even the characters were actually prisoners. They were accused of conspiracy against the Russian conqueror. So you can see that Alexander, the Russian Tsar, the Russian conqueror. So it all makes sense. And honestly, that book is so incredibly important because you've got, so the guy that I've mentioned previously, Conrad, um, he's obviously a poet. Um, and there's this part of the book that is called The Great Improvisation. And where he's he's basically talking to God about about patriotism, how he feels about Poland being oppressed and such. Um, he claims that he's equal to God, and he's saying he's basically comparing his own poetry to God's like work, so nature and and uh, things like that, so the things God created. Um, and he's basically saying that they're both equal and. They could even be better, but this, he's doing all of that out, for, out of anger. He's trying to, he's so frustrated. He's like, he's calling God out for, and he accuses God to, for, that he lets people suffer. That like, you know, he shouldn't be doing that. And, you know, pawns suffered under the rule of foreign empires. And like, he still, he still kind of wants the creator to, you know, um, show that he cares, but he's not seeing it, so he's very disappointed. Um, it, there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff about him trying to fight against God and, um, you know, getting annoyed at the whole fate of his nation and um, things like that. And it's it's just amazing. Um, and I think what's very important is that 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 book really rejuvenated the hope for Polish independence at the time. Um, you could you could see the way people um, in Poland felt, how upset they were over the whole situation. Um, so one quote that I, um, that I found from the book that's quite interesting is that our nation is like lava. On the top is, it is hard and hideous. <laughs> True. But its internal fire cannot be extinguished extinguished even in 100 years of coldness so let's spit on the crust and go down to the profundity and it's I think it's just quite sweet really and um, they're trying really hard to you know to get that independence and stuff so obviously there's there's a lot of like that uh, there's the individualistic aspect but there's also the romantic romantic message of the whole of the whole book but then you also have as I mentioned previously you get the patriotism, you get the messianistic um, and Christian vision as well, you know, as he fights with God, and um, that makes it really interesting. But then there are other opinions as well regarding the book. So other people say that there are also Slavic pagan and occult elements in the drama, um, which is, this is just three really speculation, um, to be fair, because so, um, some guy called Zdzisław Kępiński, um, I'm assuming he's a critic, um, he's suggesting that um, there's a lot of like hermetic, theosophical and alchemical philosophy uh, within the book, as well as mas Masonic symbols. Oh yeah, there was also a very controversial theory that Mickiewicz was actually a communist. Uh, frankly, I don't really buy into that. I think that's a bit mental. Um, so, yeah, big doubt. <laughs> he does not seem like a communist. And I think you'll see why when you when I'll be talking about the difference between romanticism and positivism, positivism later on. Um, but yeah, so basically the book came out and things are getting worse and worse and worse in the country. Um, we've got 1824. That's the year when basically the Russian government realized that people are starting to conspire against them. So, you know, what is their solution? It's basically to send everyone to Russia. Um, actually, that was very interesting because Miskevich was sent to Russia as well, but that actually broadened his horizons and he was he felt actually much more satisfied from going there because he he was writing more, he was more engaged into the whole situation. So he found himself to have much more freedom than he did when he, he lived at, 
in Poland at the time. So I think that's quite interesting. So then afterwards, we obviously had the November uprising. Um, that led to romantics getting that more radical wing when they really wanted to um, fight them, right? Um, and I think that this is so beautiful in my opinion because they weren't just they weren't just talking. They weren't just talking. Oh yeah, you peasants, you you go and fight and you get killed. We're just going to stand there and watch. We've planned this rebellion. Now you suffer. No, they didn't actually do that. They actually. They were literally gurus. They wrote all of the poetry. They they were mobilizing other people to join in, and then they also joined the Polish army themselves. And I think it's it's just beautiful because they weren't just saying these things. You get that so many times where people are trying to you know, I don't know. The only thing, what could I compare it to? I don't know. People who supported Blair in the Iraq War. Um, and they were, you know, oh yeah, Iraq war is good, let's let's do it, let's do it. But then, you know, you're literally not the one going there and dying. So I think I think the difference is quite massive. Also, you know, I was not supposed to get political on this channel, I'm sorry. It's just... Considering that Iraq war was kind of senseless, um, they did actually had a real cause to fight for and they did so that was something to honestly admire so obviously it gets worse Novara uprising fails and everyone gets very pessimistic about the whole situation now so that's when we, we had that very clear split between the works of people who emigrated and people who stayed in the country. Obviously for the people who stay in the country, this was much more difficult because they had to work underground, they had to um, they had to use sarcasm or something else, try to incorporate things so people, so you know, the uh, Russians or, you know, uh, Prussia wouldn't realize that they were, you know, conspiring against them. So they were, so they had to be much more clever and you know, just decide on what what course of action would damage them the least. Even still, a lot of them were still imprisoned or killed or sent to Siberia regardless. So it wasn't always successful to them. But then you also had the emigres. 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 One of them. Um, <laughs> people who emigrated. So they had much more freedom because they could obviously right from another country, so they could allow themselves this um, actually encouraging people to and you know, raising awareness of what's happening in Poland as well, which is quite cool. So so yeah, you had a lot of people who were working underground at the time. And then at that period of time, obviously so I have mentioned Mitzkevich previously, and you also had Słowacki. Um, he wrote like loads of poetry, he was quite cool, um, I've never really hated them, him. Oh, and he also wrote Baladina. Um, I definitely, I am going to cover Baladina at some point in the future as part of my book videos. Um, it's a beautiful, I think it's still poetry. I remember at school we had to do like a play based on that. So, you know, um, it was basically about those two sisters who are like, um, they had to like gather raspberries in a jug. Um, because there was this guy who wanted to marry them, and he was like, oh, whoever is going to bring more raspberries in the jug, this is the one woman I'm going to marry. And they were like, sure, cool. And, oh, should I spoil it? There is, I'm pretty sure no one translated that into English, so if I spoil it, not, you won't really care. But yeah, I may actually leave that until I'm going to be covering the book in detail. I'm just going to say it, it ends very interestingly. It's a next, oh, it's got like such Macbeth um, vibes and stuff. It's really good. Um, I, I honestly love it. Um, anyway, so afterwards, um, you also, at the, at the same time, you also had, so then we had Krasinski with his Undivine Comedy, um, which was kind of like a, 
Christian tragedy showing the terrors of revolution. Um, it, he's, so Krasinski also said that it's basically kind of like a um, discussion between the, or debate between the aristocracy and democracy. Um, if I remember correctly, um, romantics were more pro-aristocracy, um, whilst other people weren't so much. Um, on top of that, so um, actually, Undivine Comedy was translated into English at some point, so you can read it if you're interested. Um, it's, it also has a preface by G.K. Chesterton, um, who uh, some of you may, may know him, um, and it's supposed to be really good. I haven't actually read it myself, um, I'm sorry, I probably overslept to that class at literature when I was at school, that happened a lot. Um, but yeah, we definitely did cover it, so that was quite interesting. Um, so further down the line, we get 1831, um, and that, then we get Alexander Fredra, who wrote Zemsta, which basically means revenge. That was one of the staples of the time, uh, one of the most important books. And then we get the next period of time in Polish literature. It's called Positivism. Oh, this is going to be so interesting. So, Positivism came out uh, soon after the uh, failure of January Uprising. Now, so obviously it was quite a while after the Romantics were trying to advocate for independence and such. Um, a lot of the Romantics were getting older. And then you had this um, new young generation who were growing up already um, taken over by those foreign nations. So that, that was all they knew. So you had a massive clash between romantics and positivists because obviously romantics were like, we need to take back what's ours. We need to, we need to get the independence. We need to get Poland because that's what our country is. This cannot disappear off the map. It was, you know, the, uh, there was this whole spirit of trying to get what was yours. It was really beautiful and very patriotic. And then you had positivists who were, you know, so hard to be objective here. Um, they, uh, they bl basically blamed the romantic ideals for the further repression. Because obviously, after each uprising, the rules tightened and, you know, there was more repression. People, uh, the foreign nations really didn't like what was happening. So they were trying to put more and more and more constraints on Polish people. Now, positivists were like, oh, no, this is so stupid. Why do we have to be more oppressed? Because some boomers decided to fight for the country. That's so stupid. We should just accept what's happening. Um, and they were on top of that. They, It was so odd because there were... They were literally under occupation by other countries, but positivists decided to focus on more grassroots work. So they decided to go from the bottom up. So they decided suddenly, out of the blue, that you have to, oh, we have to care for women's emancipation. We have to, you know, have more tolerance for other nations. We have to um, make sure that people, the peasants get a better quality of life and stuff like that. And it's like, it's all, you know, the, the, the all social justice stuff. Sure, it's surely admirable, but like, it's really, it's surely it's not the time for that. Sorry, I am really not being objective here. I am totally on the side of romantics there. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so you get that massive conflict between the positivist utilitarian youth and the conservative romantic boomers. It's literally like boomers and zoomers these days, literally. Some things never change, huh? Um, the cool thing about positivists, though, um, they did actually write very well. Um, I probably enjoyed it for different reasons. I just found it interesting. A lot of people found it extremely grim and saddening. Um, I'm not extremely emotional person, so like I I I read a lot of things just out of like intellectual curiosity as opposed to. I don't know, reading something to get upset. So it didn't really have the same impact as it would have on, like, you know, other people. Um, but this, nonetheless, the stuff that was created under positivism was top notch. So you get Bless of Proust and his Lalka, which translate, translates into the doll. You can actually uh, get that book, I think, quite easily. There is a translation. 
I truly recommend it if you want to see what was Poland like during the 19th century. So it was really good. Um, but Bruce was also very good for his novellas. Now, again, that's another thing that is really hard to translate into English because I mean, I'm calling them novellas, but like, what what do novellas even mean to you? What what do you think of when I say novellas, right? It's basically those really short books. They're like 30 to 40 pages, um, and they have a very quick, sharp um, climax. And they, you know, it's just, it's just very simple. Something, uh, there's, there's a story, there's a story creation, something happens, action, boom, end. And it's just, oh, they're so good. They're extremely grim, extremely sad, really upsetting. You basically see, so they wanted to shift the, so I must, uh, my assumption is that when romantics were talking about, you know, engaging in war and stuff, um, they wanted people who are like them. So, you know, more nobility, more people who are a bit wealthier to join in into the conflict because obviously peasants had, you know, bigger wars than that. You know, the children were dead at like two. Um, so they couldn't really, they couldn't really, you know, sympathize with the cause. Um, and there was a shift. Positivists were trying to focus more on the lower classes and they wanted to present uh, their struggles, their problems. In a way, it's very similar to naturalist movement in France, where they were also trying to show, you know, what's dirty, disgusting, very difficult to stomach, these kind of things. And you can see it a lot in Polish novellas. Um, I am going to do a whole video on Polish novellas. I don't spoil too much. I was going to say one of those novellas include basically someone putting their child into an oven for a few prayers and the child gets accidentally cooked. So you understand how, you know, some of them are more wholesome. Some of them are genuinely sad. Um, and yeah, um, there's a few, but I am going to cover them in depth. Um, anyway, so the next person was Shinkevich. He also did a qu quite a few um, novellas, which were extremely good, um, which I'm also going to be talking about. He, so Shinkevich, um, so he did novellas. He also did Pustini v Pustje. So that translates into um, in the desert and in tundra, I think. Um, that was for like younger. Um, younger people generally it was supposed to be a very good book there is a movie based on that as well not sure if any of that is translated into english though um but then you've got a lot of other you know proper fleshed out books such as Ognim in Miechem, so that translates into with fire and sword that's actually a very good title i mean it sounds much better in english but it's it's a good title then you've got the, I'm assuming, Templars. Then you've got Covadis. Then you've got the Flood. Um, and these, like, they, there are a few parts of, like, one story. They're, like, massive books. They're quite interesting. Um, I kind of recommend. But also you've got some women who also wrote some books. Like Konopnitska, who wrote a small... Horsey? I should really be checking the translations of these things because I, I cannot translate things on the spot. I am terrible at this, honestly. Um, I can't believe I just translated this to small horsey. Um, anyway, that was also really sad because I think it's about some horse dying. Anyway, positivism is very... It's a very special period because they do everything's just grim. I swear to God, I think that reading Posit Positivist book ruined me, ruined me entirely because I don't want to, like, I hate happy endings. I really do. And I bet this is because <laughs> Positivism ruined me because I started enjoying people dying constantly. <laughs> so it's just honestly terrible. Um, right. Should I continue or should I not continue yet? So we, then we get 
the, the young Poland period of time. Um, again, young Poland sounds really terrible, really lame. Um, it actually sounds quite cool in Polish because it's like Moda Polska. Um, but yeah, so this is the very interesting shift. So young Poland actually rejected the concept of positivism. Interesting, young generation actually wanted to go back to the old ways. They embraced romanticism again. Um, it was this, you know, it was obviously neo-romanticism. Um, they've also decided to embrace a few other things, such as symbolism, decadentism, individualism. So it was a very interesting period because it was. So it seemed like romanticism was just, you know, a call to action, patriotism, and such. Young Poland, they went so much. They burned so much quicker and brighter, and that just killed them. It's so interesting because, like, a lot of people during that period actually went into a complete mental override and either killed themselves or just went mental. It was a very interesting time because, obviously, you know, the, the situation doesn't change. You're still under occupation. You're still in a terrible situation. You've just decided to reject all of the previous beliefs and opinions, and you've decided to embrace what's, what's old. But you were left with the dissatisfaction that maybe anything that you're trying to do, it's, it's not going to help because everything's in decline and you're just not going to make it. So you could see how that could very quickly turn very, extremely nihilistic. And I kind of think that positivists at the time were trying to do that shift just to kind of save themselves from even thinking about it, some kind of avoidance in a way. But then young Poland decided to embrace it anew. You know, young generation, new ideas, new plans, you know, thinking that they're going to be greater, they're going to change the world, that they're going to be different. But no, <laughs> it just didn't happen. So a lot of people during that time were writing, for example, um, Tadeusz Bo Boy Zielinski, um, very good poet, I do recommend him. Um, and we also have Vespiansky uh, with his Vesela, which mean, which translates to the wedding. Yeah, I had to, I had to, I'm pretty sure I had to write a, an essay about that book and I wasn't really a fan. That was also afterwards you get modernism and naturalism um, so with naturalism I'm assuming they kind of took it from France at the time um, they were also trying to um, criticize people's deceitfulness and to, to face itness and things like that so it was quite an interesting period so you've got I'm just name dropping right now so but then you get Jeromsky and Raymond they're very important people very influential ones from the period they wrote the uh, Sisyphean works and homeless people. I'm pretty sure I read homeless people and it's a really beautiful um, book. It, I'd say that it verges on Orwell's non-fictional work. It's really good. Um, and then you've got the, the whole book titled The Peasants and that's another excellent novel because that um, again, it's kind of, I'm assuming you, you get back to those positivist um, elements when you try to, when you maybe try to write about um, the lower classes, but you still try to incorporate some other themes within it. Um, and yeah, The Peasants were a beautiful novel, honestly. Um, pretty sure there should be a translation, so if you're interesting, I would recommend you to give it a read because it's just interesting for, you know, from the anthropological uh, point of view, I'd say. Um, it's just very interesting. So afterwards, we obviously get the World War I and World War II. So that was a very difficult period for Poland. So during the interwar period, uh, Poland finally got back their independence. So that happened in 1918. And then they lost it again in 1939. Obviously, as we know, um, first thing that Hitler do was to, you know, um, take over Poland. Um, so that's when they lost it. Um, but yeah, the interwar period was quite interesting when you think about it, because that's when obviously all the literary 
um, and creative stuff started to really flourish. So you had some literary unions, you also had the um, creation of Polish PEN or PEN. Um, so that was quite important. Um, but what's very interesting is that interwar period in Poland is split into two different periods. So you get the first one that was heavily optimistic, you know, you've got hope for the future, general happiness, you've got, you know, everyone's filled with joy and stuff. So there was a time when you had this commander group. They were creating stuff that was, you know, very positive, very happy, you know, we were rebuilding, everything's great, you know, build back better, stuff like that, you know, everything's fantastic. But then you had the other group. They were they weren't very so sure of what's going to happen in the future. They became very pessimistic. They they had this sense of dread and misery. They were worried about the fall of the civilization. Um they also saw what was happening in the thirties, so you know, the Great Depression, um, you know, what was happening to the markets. They were seeing that and Obviously, the financial situation wasn't really good at the time in Poland. So, despite some other people being heavily optimistic, they were like, no, no, look at what's happening in the world. This is not going to get better. It's getting worse. Listen to us. And you had more and more catastrophic literature as well. So, they were starting to like predict things that were really not going well. And... So then obviously you get the um, catastrophic literature and you also get Witkiewicz. He was a fantastic guy, honestly. Like um, He was not only a painter, but he was also um, a writer. He did a few plays. I've seen them. They're honestly the best thing. Um, they're really surrealist to some extent, but they're so good. Um, the guy was absolutely mental. Um, so he would, he would paint on the drugs and he would then... So he would do portraits, right? And this is very important. He would do portraits on drugs. And then he would write down, um, obviously he would do his signature, but he would also write down specific codes for which drugs he used at the time of painting it. He was honestly just crazy. Um, but he did a lot of good stuff, and I actually, my hometown is known to have the biggest collection of his works. So that's very good. Um, but yeah, the interwar period was very difficult because um, they were extremely pessimistic at the time and they were expecting the future to get extremely dark. They could also see the rise of the Soviet Union as well as the Third Reich um, and they just knew that it's just not going to be good. They were really worried. Hm. You know what? They were correct because, you know, you know, the situation is getting worse. So then, so then you got a few others, few other um, writers and creations, such as you've got Gombrowicz with Ferdi Durke. It's quite fascinating how a lot of people from that period res resorted to very surrealist um, writings, quite similar to, to some extent, to like Dadaism um, during the war. Uh, that was created as a as this kind of rebellion against the war was extremely anti-war. So similarly, I think they were trying to kind of touch on the similar themes there. So that was quite interesting. Um, also at the time, there was a massive rise of um, out of children's books. Uh, I'm assuming these were the people who are more <laughs> from the optimist tent. Um, they were really good. Um, a lot of plenty of generations of children have read them. I've read most of them when I was a kid, so they did actually um, have a massive impact on, you know, the culture in the country at the time. And then <laughs> you get something that completely ruined Poland forever. So, you know, with all the catastrophism and pessimism and suicides and um, the schizophrenia and stuff like that, it turns out that the mental pessimistic people were actually correct. World War II hits, Poland gets occupied again. So, you know, that's just terrible. Like, the stuff just that happens is just so bad. So, most intellectuals ended up in concentration camps or gulags. Or, you know, if they were lucky, 
they em emigrated to another country. So that was, you know, that was kind of good for them. But majority of them were, you know, killed off. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Katyn massacre, but that was, uh, I think that was 1945. Um, a bunch of um, intellectuals were actually killed off by the Soviets. So, you know, um, communists weren't really doing too much good work at the time. Um, but yeah, um, some people who remained in the country, they were doing, you know, underground poetry or prose meetups, trying to, you know, cultivate the Polish culture and such, even though it was very difficult. Um, they say that as much as between 200 to 1500 publications were actually related to literature, so they were trying to safeguard it as much as possible. So then, Obviously, you know, it's, it's been a while, so you get a whole new generation of poets under occupations, who, under the occupation, who did actually a lot of good work. Um, they were basically called the Columbovia, so um, Columbuses. So you get the guy who was called Baczynski. He did a lot of good work, but he actually died during the war, so that was very upsetting. And you've got Miłosz. You've probably heard of him. I'm not really, he's, I'm not really vibing with the guy. Um, but he was very important in those circles. He eventually got a Nobel um, Prize as well. Then you get, I, I'm just, again, I'm just throwing a few names out there so you know, um, you know, who was creating when. So you get Tadeusz Borowski. So then you've got a lot of other people. Um, you also get a book called Stones for the Rampart. Um, that was written by Alexander Kaminsky. That was actually very good. I'm not really a massive fan of the um, war literature, um, Polish war literature, um, but this was honestly spot on. It was a beautiful book, honestly. Um, it was really, it was really heartbreaking to some extent. Um, and normally, I'm not really a massive fan of the emotional memoirs things like that but this was more this more covered like heroism and you know those young people who are trying to you know um they were like yeah a group of polish boy scouts who are um taking part in the resistance movements in nazi occupied warsaw um and they were trying to rescue someone from gestapo captivity and a lot of people die it's just terrible honestly like the book's so good and it's so heartbreaking um what's really interesting is that it's non-fiction as well yeah. So, some of the stuff that was created at the time was actually genuinely very good. Um, but yeah, you also had other stuff, such as um, Maria Dombrowska. Um, she did a lot of diaries and memoirs. I d yeah, again, another thing that you have to read um, in Poland as part of your like um, school curriculum. Um, didn't really like that uh, myself, but it's good if you like emotional stuff, I guess. Post-war you had obviously um you know everyone else was happy and was rejoicing you know be they everyone's happy and poland's you know and uh, still taken over by the communist state you know under people's poland republic it's bullshit honestly um it wasn't really a good time for poland and um, people had to have rations rations um it's just it was terrible there was still censorship and stuff and what i really hate a lot of people actually gave in and decided to just write things that were propaganda and it's just disgusting um one person i wanted to single out here uh, so i'm very conflicted about this because so there's this guy who is called um Władysław Brunievski. he's my flat out my favorite polish poet he's amazing he suffered a lot during the war he he was in world war one then he was also in world war two i mean he didn't fight i think um but he was obviously creating a lot of literary stuff, he was writing poetry and stuff, but he had, so he started off as a socialist, and then he, and then he was like, oh, communism is great, and then, and then Soviet Union conquers Poland, and he's like, huh, imagine that, oh wow, great surprise, honestly, you were literally supporting this all along, anyway, so then he, this is so conflicting because eventually he gets arrested. Um, prior to that, obviously he writes a lot of propaganda for them, um, but eventually they arrest him anyway because you know that's that's kind of what was happening, you know, under Russian occupation, which a lot of people always forget. 
you know, if you ever read Solzhenitsyn, I cannot pronounce that, and Gulag Archipelago, you know that it was just hellish. He basically, he refused a lot of their um, requests. So Brunevsky supported communists to some extent, but then obviously he was treated terribly by them. Um, he did try to kind of, you know, refuse some of their requests, but he was still writing propaganda. He was trying to... He was trying to say that he wasn't, you know, supporting it wholeheartedly, and they were asking him to create a new um, anthem, and he refused to. So, you know, he wasn't that bad of a guy, but, like, he did definitely compromise his values a lot. Uh, but then again, his values were, in nature, socialistic and communist, so did he really compromise his values? Doubt. <laughs> anyway, so... You get a lot of other people, you get Gauchinsky, you've got Ruzhevich. Um So, a lot of them were writing anti-communist stuff, but you had plenty of people from the literary circles who got coerced into writing socialist realism stuff, and they happily did it. Um, so, you've got the 60s, and you've got a lot of uh, creators at the time. Um, so you've got Shimborska. You may have heard of her because she got Nobel Prize as well, um, and she was quite important within, you know, Polish circles as well. Um, she was doing like reflections on the past and the future, the humanism, modernism, and such. Um, you had Mrozek. He wrote Tango. I went to see the play. It was beautiful. Strongly recommend. And then you've got uh, I think it's Stanislaw Lem. He wrote uh, science fiction, the, literally the father of Polish science fiction. Strongly recommend. He's great. He wrote Solaris, really cool fantasy dude. Not fantasy, science fiction specifically. So other than that, you've got Mark Kwasko. Oh, he's really good. Um, I still need to read him. Actually, I haven't read him. I've only read like snippets. Um, but his writing style is beautiful. Probably completely butchered during translation, but nonetheless a really good guy. But then, obviously Poland is still under the Soviet occupation. Um, again, I'm not, really, I'm not very patriotic when it comes to Poland, but the whole communist period, it just boils my blood, honestly, because like, so many people compromising their values for for the foreign nation who rules them it's just wrong you know it's terrible and you know surely you have to pretend surely you have to you know be clever and you know you need to make your money and you don't want to get arrested but surely just join some underground people or something and find ways to to do it differently because it's just terrible so <laughs> you had a whole so the best translation i could find is the acne faced generation I'm not joking, literally. Acne faced generation. They were the worst lot, in my opinion. I am so sorry, I am so biased about this. So, they were completely wholeheartedly supporting communism. Um, they were aggressive, they were terrible, they were trying to con convince people this is a good way, they were happily writing propaganda, and they were just happily eating all the stuff that the state was giving to them, it was just terrible. Um, what's really funny is that, that that lady who got the Nobel Prize, Szymborska, she was part of it as well. I didn't even know. Never meet your heroes, honestly. It's not worth it. But yeah, then at the time you get the letter 34. So a lot of intellectuals are protesting against the censorship because guess what? There was plenty of censorship after com under communism in Poland. It was just very bad because everything had to go through state. So if you didn't say something that would support the state or if you were even trying to stray away from it, it just wouldn't get published. It just wouldn't. Like the libraries and the... Um, and the bookstores were flooded with all the pro-Stalin stuff. Um, I don't know if... I'm sorry, I'm not sure if Stalin was at the time. But, like, pro-Soviet Union stuff, pro-communism stuff. And, like, if you were trying to write something, anything else, you literally couldn't. It was terrible. So, but then you had the letter 34. Um, intellectuals were trying to protest against that. But it wasn't very successful, though. Because, again, um, I think in response to the letter 34, um, there was 
um, Soviet Union like made up like with fake numbers and stuff their own thing and they were like oh no people 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 do like censorship people love it look at that and yeah just terrible so afterwards uh, you've got the whole new generation they're called the new a new the new wave um, they were very clever and they were trying to avoid censorship so they were trying to use like metaphors and parables to you know avoid being very open about what they really thought but if you were clever enough you would understand it so that was just fantastic they were doing a really good job and then eventually we get the 70s and 80s that's I think in the 80s eventually uh, Poland is no longer under communism because you've got Valencia and people like that who are actually trying to, you know, um, get Poland to, you know, proper situation. So that's when things get more <coughs> open and free and like, God, I was trying to find um, a good translation for these things but I could only think in like Zoomer terms so I do apologize. So you had like three movements, there was like cottage core. Which was ba like, which was mainly focused on like um, villages, thing you know, the life of the peasants and stuff. Then you had the Jewish core, which was mainly things done by the Jews and stuff. And then you've got you've had the Kresse core, um, which was a completely whole different thing. Then you had Vojacek. He was a fantastic poet, one of my favorites. Um, he was extremely pessimistic, nihilistic, half pornographic. And then you've got the brilliant Stahura. I'd say that he's better than Bronievsky, in my opinion. He was honest, like, you, you cannot translate him into English, it's just impossible. He's too good. He's literally too good. The wording that he uses is just so beautiful. Even to this day, you can barely find many translations of his poems, because they're just so difficult to translate. I've tried, and I failed, honestly. Um, I do have very fond memories of him reading his stuff though, it's beautiful. Um, but yeah, so then eventually you get 80s and 90s, if you get more political writing because you know there's no censorship so they can be more honest about what they think um, and eventually you get postmodernism obviously. Um, some bits of postmodernism in Poland weren't that bad, you had Świetlitsky, he was excellent, um, it's this this poem is his. It's honestly the best thing I've ever read. I mean, you may. It could be lost in translation. Who knows? Maybe not. But I hope that you like it. Anyway, so that's going to be me for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. That is that is as done with Polish literature. Um, I think the most important points are that Polish history is strongly reflected in Polish literature. You cannot have one or the other. You have to understand both to understand what you know what they actually went through. Obviously there is plenty of suffering and death and you know attempts to you know fight for uh, for what they want and you can see that a lot in what Polish nation is as it is. Again I am not very patriotic myself like why would I be speaking in English right now and making videos in, in sitting in Scotland like but if anything makes ever makes me patriotic, it's probably Polish literature. It's it's honestly something else. You really understand the collect. Oh, I hate the word collective. I'm not going to use it. Um, you really understand the general. You know the the pain of the nation, the the struggle, the suffering, the um, everything they went through. It was there were so many things, so many occupations, and it is strongly reflected in there. Uh, and you know what they were writing about and I think this is a massive difference between Poland and many of the Western countries as well because there's just there's just not that much happiness and goodness to be able to write about simple as like obviously in the previous video I was saying that you had the I mean I don't think I said that but during Poniatowski that king you did have golden age of, of Poland they were very happy, they had the Lithuanian Commonwealth, literature was flourishing, it was, you know, everything was going so well. And then eventually it just, you know, and you can see that. And again, they say that literature is the, you can only create very well if you've suffered, if you've 
if you actually went through some stuff. And I think that is certainly the case with Polish stuff, because you can... it. I'm trying to find a good metaphor for this, because it's just... it's just so... it's so much... it's so real. You, you can actually feel it. The way you read it, it's just... it really moves you in a way. And I don't get moved very much by many things. Um, sometimes if they're genuinely good and there is some stuff within Polish literature that is honestly honestly worth reading and I think you can see that um, in Polish nation in general like the way the way people are like if you've ever been to Poland I, I don't know if you have um, <laughs> Polish people are very rude they're overly honest and they're very negative like you would go to the shop, no one would be polite, no one would be tactful. It's terrible. You've you literally have the most hellish experience of your life. I went to Poland last year, um, and I went to the shop and I was like, no one's asking me how am I? No one's asking me if I need something. I'm going over to the counter and the lady looks at me like I've just killed her father or something. It is terrible. But then but they're also very resilient. They're very hard working. They know what they want and they just stick to it. It doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter how tough things get, they will find a way to fix their situation. And I think that you can really, if you have a comprehensive understanding of Polish literature, you can understand why. They just went through so much stuff that it really makes sense. Okay, well, that's all for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I am so sorry that this was so long. Um, Macie, please do like, do subscribe, and do share the video. Um, if you would like to donate some money, feel free to do that. I've got subscribe star in the description of the video, so that would be very nice. Um, but yeah, um, I hope you, I honestly hope that you enjoyed the video. Please do, if you feel like you need to offer me some feedback, just send me a message or a comment. I'll be happy to accept it. Um, and yeah, next week is a bit of a surprise. We are going to be talking about a book, that's for sure. Um, I may be covering some Russian literature, so get prepared for that. Anyway, right, goodbye, have a lovely weekend, and honestly, I just sacrificed my Saturday night for you, so you better enjoy that. Goodbye.